shoulder replacement. So keep praying for her. Uh, she should be starting therapy soon, if not already. And then uh, my grandnephew, Zion, we've been praying for him for quite a while. Uh, they had to rush him back into the hospital. He's at Akron Children's Hospital right now there in Ohio. And uh, uh, they had to put a feeding tube in last week. Uh, he has declined a fair amount. And so they put the feeding tube in to try to build him up so they can do the heart surgery. And uh, he ended up getting fluid in one or both lungs. And so they had to put him back in. He vomited. The I, I don't even know how he can do this. Vomited the uh, feeding tube out. So they reinserted it early today. They put in two pick lines. They are trying to prep him and ready him for heart surgery next week. Now they're going to have to go in and rebuild the mitral valve uh, for him, um, which doesn't seem like that big of a deal when it comes to heart surgeries. But for him, his body is very small. And they're the whole deal the whole time is we need to get him bigger. He needs to be older. We can't do it. It's too risky. There is a doctor at Cleveland Clinic, a surgeon there, that said he will do it. So it is a critical surgery for him, but they're trying to build him up right now. So if you would keep remembering him. And of course, I mentioned my wife has COVID and uh, she's uh, pretty congested, coughing quite a bit. So, you know, normally you hear about COVID now, it's not a big deal. But the doctors told her it's kind of a combination of Delta and some other I guess that's what's happening right now, a combination. I, I just heard when I was down Monday, I'm trying to think where I was Monday. Oh, well yesterday we were at a radio station for the um, ministry down there, and a pastor came in and said that um, he had a church where they had to shut it down. Everybody had COVID, and that's the plan to hospitalize. So I guess when you think it's all gone, it just kind of comes and goes as it likes. Most of it has been very light, but I guess whatever's going on now is a little, a little bit stiffer than it was last year. So this is her third time, Betty's third time to have COVID. Uh, so keep, keep her in prayer. And then on the expectant mothers list, of course, we have a lot of ladies. You know, my daughter-in-law down in Louisville, uh, Bethany, found out last week that she's due in October. So we praise the Lord for that. And then um, with the special needs, Covenant Presbyterian Church there in Nashville. Um, just let's remember these people. Um, can't, cannot imagine, you know, we, we have security here. We have people that patrol. We have a security system, all those things. And I'm sure they did too, but that, that individual found a way to get in and do what they did. So God is still in control. He's still on the throne. He has a purpose in everything, though many times... We do not understand it, so I don't know anything about this church or this institution other than it's at least Christian by name, but um, it's really I need a lot of prayer for those families right now. All right, we'll go ahead and take any special requests or there may be updates or praises if you have any tonight. We'll certainly take those. Anything at all tonight? All right, if not, that's fine. But we'll now when I'm when I finish preaching tonight. I'm just going to sit back out like I did. Again, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to keep you from getting anything just in case I would happen to um, have it. I don't think I do, but you know, just, just being safe. So, brother, I apologize. I'm going to have you just to come up and tell us about your ministry and uh, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and what the Lord's doing in your life and as we really are glad to have you here tonight, and I apologize, you know, for just just a strange introduction I gave to you. So I hope I hope you'll be patient with me. But you come on ahead, and the Lord bless you tonight. Good evening. I am Evangelist Dan Manka, and I'm a school teacher of 45 years. I got to teach school electrics. Secondary electrics here, and we've known them for many years. When we were here many years ago, we heard uh, they get it right now. Uh, Don Gasman, is that the right name? He was a he came as a guest speaker uh, about 30 years ago or 28 years ago here, and uh, I teach uh, Valerie Baker and Mason Baker. Valerie was on my 
volleyball team. I was a volleyball coach and I used to call her Slider. She put on her knee pads and they had to be able to get down on their knees and uh, she could slide across the floor and hit the ball and do a great job. So I, I gave her the nickname of Slider and uh, that was many, many years ago. That was 28 years ago. So, And we're glad to be here once again. And uh, we have been in the band's open for 32 years. Calvary Christian School has closed its doors and for the last uh, almost two years now, I've been a full-time evangelist, and uh, the Lord has allowed us to minister in 45 states, seven provinces of Canada, all across Canada, from coast to coast, even twice out in Vancouver Island, out in the Pacific Ocean, in, uh, in just British Columbia, Canada there, and then down in Mexico, and in seven Indian reservations, out in front of George Bush's house, in front of the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue, I uh, had a street meeting there on a January 1st, it was supposed to be weather sunny and blue sky and uh, January 1st, but it was a nice day, and I played a lot of harp, and we sang hymns and talked about that, and we're glad to be with you here today. Uh, the Lord, uh, two months ago, I told them the Fellowship Baptist Church, I said, we have no meetings at all for six and a half months, and that was the way it was last year, uh, and then uh, we took a trip uh, February 3rd, we left for one day of meeting in uh, Georgia. It was the first time we ever had any ministry in Georgia at all, so now we minister in 45 states. And uh, so down there we had one day of meetings, and the Lord changed that into over a month and a half of meetings. We didn't get back home until this past month. This, no, this past Sunday? Really? Oh, wow. Time's going fast. <laughs> wow, that's hard to believe. I was preaching up in Pennsylvania uh, last Sunday, and... Uh, it was our 12th time to be with that group up there. I preached 10 weeks of meetings for them. They invite one evangelist each summer for their camp, and they had me. They invited me eight summers in a row. We were able to go six summers in a row, and other times. So we were there for 10 weeks of meetings since 1997. And uh, so we're glad to be here with you. Back in um, uh, in October, the Lord gave me a poem. I've written 28 books. They're out in the van, and uh, 13 books of poetry. Uh, but this is a poem that's not in the book yet, but I've been reading one of these stanzas every time I get to the pulpit uh, since October, and the title is, I'm Not Allowed to Worry. And so the verse 5 says, I'm not allowed to worry, I'm, I am not to fret and stew. And we're pretty good at that. We're, we're professional fretters. Now, I'm a fretted dulcimer, and I have frets on my banjo and my guitar and things like that, and I can fret with my fingers, but we're not, we're not made to fret with our mind and with our heart. I, I am not to, uh, to fret and stew. I trust the loving Jesus and he will help me through. And that's why, well, we, we don't worry. We're not, not supposed to worry because we're not made to worry. We're not allowed to worry. Worry is sin. The angel said, uh, fear not. And uh, God told us not to fret uh, and uh, not to worry about anything. We should trust him. And that's why another reason why we don't worry is I trust the loving Jesus and he will help me through. So we don't need to worry. And as I said, I'm evangelist Dan Manka, and I'm going to have my wife Renee come on up here, and uh, Rebecca, our oldest daughter. The three of us were half of the faculty at Calvary Christian School uh, two years ago when they closed the doors. And uh, among the three of us, would you hold that? Uh, among the three of us, we have 90 years of teaching experience. And uh, so uh, we're glad to be here with you and and share our ministry with you. And wherever we go, we used to, before I started writing hymns, we used to sing these two songs in the pew, back to back, because it's so important. The first one says, the most important thing in life is to see you saved, to see you're on your way to heaven. And the second one is that once you're saved, God wants you to be a volunteer to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> It's a grand thing to be a Christian, it's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus, anywhere and everywhere you go. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in the army here below. It's the grandest thing 
praise the Lord. I haven't heard those songs for a while. Praise the Lord for that. You didn't know you were going to get special music tonight, did you? Praise the Lord. Well, we've been going through the book of Proverbs this next month. Of, well, we're not quite in April yet, but in May it'll be a year. And so I didn't think we'd be going this long, but we have. And so we're actually in chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30. Of course, last week with the missions conference, uh, I, I almost went ahead and just, there, there are things in the book of Proverbs concerning soul winning and missions. I thought about just taking tonight and using that as a follow-up to what we heard last week, but I thought, you know, we started this, we've been in chapter 30 for two weeks, I just want to continue to go with this, and then uh, we may go back and look at that later on. So we're nearing the end of this study, but uh, Proverbs chapter 30, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll look into God's word tonight. Father, thank you so much for being so good to us, uh, just, just thank you, Lord, for allowing this dear family to come our way and being a chance to meet them. Lord, thank you for their their service to you and their love for you, and I pray God you continue to use them in a very, very special way. Lord, I just thank you for what you did for our church last week, uh, the good response, the good numbers that were here. Lord, people's hearts being tender to your word last week, thank you for that. And we ask that you would work here tonight right here in this auditorium, uh, Lord, there in the Family Life Building as, as the uh, Awana Ministry is doing the Grand Prix tonight, that you would just uh, use it as an opportunity to uh, maybe get the gospel to someone that might be visiting there tonight. Lord, that you would work in the team ministry tonight. All that's going on here this evening, we want you to be glorified in it. And Father, uh, we always take time to spend before your throne in prayer after we conclude the time of teaching and preaching. Lord, you know the requests that have been brought forth tonight, and there are certainly many names on this prayer list. Lord, you do a work to work in those lines, especially those on the spiritual list. Uh, Lord, thank you for those who have made decisions for you. Thank you, Lord, for the lives that have been changed. But there are many, many more who need to be saved many others who need to be made right with you. So, Lord, you work during that time as well. Again, thank you for this book. I ask that you would speak through me tonight. I just praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 30. I presented this, it was three weeks ago, actually, when we began to look at this particular chapter. And I present this from the standpoint of what I believe is happening here, and that is a a conversation from a gentleman named Agur, who is speaking to Ithiel and Yukal. Don't know if they're his friends or if they're relatives, whoever these men may be. And this is, to me, a conversation. Now, we know what a proverb is, a short, as they say, pithy saying, driving home a point. And when you read what Solomon wrote, most of those statements are in verse form or maybe just a couple verses, and they drive home a point. When you come to this particular chapter, there is obviously similarities to that. These are proverbs, but these are uh, more elongated than the others that Solomon wrote. And I, I look at this as just one solid conversation that flows from one thought into another as Agur is speaking to these two men. And so... A few weeks ago, we looked at verses 2 and 3. It says, Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. And I presented it this way. Agur is recognizing what he really is. He was recognizing who he really is. He said, I am brutish. And he said, I have not learned wisdom. Now, for a man who is being used of the Holy Spirit to present God's word, that sounds strange, but I'm going to tell you something. I believe that should be our continual attitude. God, I haven't obtained. There is still much more that I need to learn from you. 
and at the end of each thought, I just I give a question. And the question is this, do I recognize what I really am? Do we recognize tonight what we really are outside of Jesus Christ? How great our need is. Yes, we may be born again, washed in the blood of Christ, but in our own flesh, there is a great need. We've not attained to wisdom yet. We've not attained to knowledge yet. There's so much more. And sometimes Christians get to the point, it's like, well, I already know that. I uh, had an uh, in individual I knew who had read through his Bible, and he said, I don't need to read it again. I've already read it. I already know it. Now, now that person, praise the Lord, no longer thinks that way, but for a while that's the way he thought. I've read it. I already know it. I don't need to read it again. Well, you and I know that's not the case. When we look at verses 4 through 6, who hath ascended up into the heaven or descended, who hath gathered the wind in his fist, who hath bound the waters in a garment, who hath established all the ends of the earth, what is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And I'm just recapping right now, but in this section here, Agor is saying, I recognize who I really need. The first two verses, I recognize who I am, and therefore now I recognize who I really need. And obviously in verse 4 he's saying, I need, I need the Lord. I need him. Verse 5, I need his word. Listen, we need the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. We need that constant communication with him, and we need this book. Jesus Christ is the living word. This book is his written word. We need both. We need both. And verse 6 talks about the fact that there's nothing we need to add to that. You know, we used to sing the chorus, Jesus Christ is made to me all I need, all I need. He alone is all my plea. He is all my need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness is the hour, my redemption full and free. He is all I need. This book is all you need. Jesus Christ is all you need. When you think about that, it brings you to this thought. Do I recognize who I really need. A lot of Christians try to satisfy themselves with everything and anything but God's word and the person of his son. And then we look at verses 7 through 9. Two things have I required of thee. Deny them not. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient with me. And here Agor is saying I I'm recognizing what I really need. Now, he puts it in such a way that almost sounds disrespectful because he's obviously talking to God. And he said, this is what I'm requiring of you, God. Now, if you're going to require something of God, if you're going to put it in those terms, and really the attitude is a request, but if you were going to go to God and before his face say, God, this is what I require of you, this is what you want to require of God. First, he said, I want you to remove from me vanity and lies. I want you to remove vanity from me. Anything that's empty and useless in my life, God, this is what I want you to do. I want you to remove it from me. Now listen, that's a request and a requirement I think that God would be more than happy to oblige us with. I want you to remove anything that's empty and useless in my life. And then he says, remove from me lies. Anything, God, that will deceive me. And keep me from loving you as I ought. Keep me from serving you as I ought. Keep me from having to walk with you in a relationship I should have with you. God, remove that deceit. Remove from me those lies. And then he said in verse 8, feed me with food convenient for me. The word convenient means appointed to me. God, what you want me to have, that's what I want. Now, when he said feed me with food, I, I believe he's talking about physical food. We know that the Word of God tells us that He provides us, you know, our daily bread. Jesus said, you need to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. And as we continue to see things decline and the threats to our economy, the threat to supply, we see shortages, that may be something that will come in very handy, if you want to put it that way, in seeking God for your daily provision. Now, right now, that's not your case. That's not our case. We've got a pantry with food, cupboards with food, a freezer with food, a refrigerator filled with food. More than likely in your homes, it, that is true as well. That may not last. 
God may, and I believe he will, at some point bring this nation to its true kingdom. And as a believer, we need to be able to go before God and say, God, give me what I need today. Help me not to focus on tomorrow. Help me to get what I need today. So I do believe he's talking about food, and yet at the same time, the word food means supply. And it makes me think about what Jesus or what Paul said in Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Food, clothing, shelter, encouragement, whatever it may be, God can supply what is appointed, what is necessary for you so that you can honor him and live for him. So he said, this is what I am requiring of you, God. He's not requiring wealth. He's not requiring things that would make them forget God. He said, I I want these things that will help me focus on you. And you notice in verse 9, he says, God, I want you to just give me what's convenient for me, what is appointed to me, so I don't deny you if I get too full, if I have too much, nor that I would take your, your name in vain if I have too little. God, give me what you want me to have that I keep you focused on you. And so the question at the end of that section is, do I recognize what I really need, what I really am, who I really need, and what I really need? And that brings us to verse 10. In this verse he says, Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found guilty. Again, here's a proverb. It can stand on its own, but I think Agor is presenting this as a flowing conversation. And he says this to these two men, accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found guilty. I think Agor is saying, I need to recognize the importance of dealing with myself first. Dealing with self first before I even have a thought toward others. Accuse, what does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Basically to slander somebody. To slander someone to their master. I want you to go back to the book of Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 6. Of course, we're all very familiar with the book of Job. And you notice in verse 6 of Job chapter 1, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Man, wouldn't you love that to be said of you? I mean, Job was God's choice servant. Job was God's man. Verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Job, in essence, slanders God's servant. You know, you you take away some of these blessings from this man, (laughs) he'll be like anybody else. He'll he'll curse you to your face, God. He'll do that to you. He slandered Job. Now, we know the great testing and great trial that God allowed Job to go through, what God allowed to happen to his children and to his possessions and to his own health. But God was not hoodwinked by Satan. God allowed this for a purpose And if not just for Job's personal benefit, and when you read the 42nd chapter of Job, when Job has now a new level of relationship with God, if you will, when he said, I've heard of thee with the hearing of mine ears, but now, what? Mine eye seeth thee. Similar to Isaiah chapter 6. Similar to what Jacob had experienced. Just a whole new level. Listen, sometimes God sends you through the valleys through the trials to bring you to a new level of of 
fellowship with God. And that certainly happened with Job. So God allowed these things to happen, but God was not hoodwinked by what Satan said. Satan slandered God's servant. And here you find this statement made back in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 10. We're not to accuse uh, uh, a servant unto his master. We're not to slander someone. So for me, I need not accuse others for things I imagine I see but don't truly understand. Instead, I need to deal with my biggest culprit. And my biggest culprit is not you. It's me. I'm saying it's real easy for me to look down at other people and to wonder their motivations, why they're not in God's house, or why they don't serve, or why they don't do this or that. You know, it's very easy for me to be very condemning toward people. You know what? There is a responsibility that I have as a pastor to be concerned about the spiritual temperature of the church family. And you understand that, and I understand that. That is a responsibility. And I will not, I'll be honest, it's not one I cherish. I'm just being honest with you. But the, but the biggest culprit in my life is not other people. It's just God. And I need to be looking at my own life because I can look at someone and say, man, they should be here tonight and only find out that I neglect my wife. Maybe they're sick. Uh, I had recently been concerned about an individual and um, found out there's a legitimate reason why they have not been coming. And you can let your mind wander and think all kind of thoughts about people and, you know, your heart condemn them and your heart accuse them. And if, if we're not careful, we go to somebody else and say, well, that's, that's so-and-so, that's the rascal that ought to be in God's house. And shame on them only to find out you're way off base. You're way off base. And I believe what Egor is saying to his friends is this. You know what? I, I just need to worry about dealing with myself. Let God deal with his own servants. It's not my job to slander those people. It's not my job to think that way. And I think about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Just judge yourself. It's not my privilege to judge other people. Now, I know in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, whoever is spiritual does what? Judgeth all things. And that's true. And I can look at somebody's life and say something is not correct. There has to be a reason why this is going on in their life without condemning them. I can do that without condemning them. But when you accuse somebody, you are slandering them. You may be uh, slandering them because you're so far from truth. You can still judge, in a sense, and investigate to find out what the need is. Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense? So here, Job says, or uh, Egwer says, I need to make sure I deal with myself first. And again, reminds me of what Paul said to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. He said, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. Test your own self. I'm not, I'm not a tester of Vern Underwood. I'm not here to, you know, try to make determinations of what is in his heart. That's between him and God. I've, I've got enough to worry about with my own self, much less coming down against someone else. So again, the question is, do I recognize the importance of dealing with myself and not constantly be condemning others, accusing others? And then you come to verses 11 through 14. He says, there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. And this this 
paragraph, I believe Agor is saying, I need to recognize uh, the need to be a chosen generation, not like this generation. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter said, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. And I, always, I, just, I know how, how that sounds to people, peculiar. I don't want to be peculiar, but listen, you sell yourself out to Jesus Christ, you talk different, walk different, act different, dress different. Listen, you become pe- peculiar to people. Of course, you know what he means by that. You know that he means that we are his purchased possession. We're, we're special to him. He purchased us with his own blood. We understand that. But what's the purpose of this? Why are you and I a chosen generation that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light? That is my purpose as a chosen generation. That is the purpose of my royal priesthood. That is the purpose for which he has made me his own special treasure, a peculiar person before him that I should show forth his praises to the lost. Now, I think about that, and I compare it with what we hear about this particular generation, this generation that curses father and mother, this generation that is pure in their own eyes, this generation that is lofty, this generation that devours others, so to speak, as he says in verse 14. So I thought about what we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3 for a minute and look at verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. For this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. I know the last days can cover almost the entire period of the New Testament or the New Covenant. I understand that, but I believe when Paul speaks here, he is speaking in particular about the last days. And I'll, and I'll say it again, you know, I believe we are in the last days. Now, how long will that last? Will that last five years, ten years, fifteen, seventy-five? I don't know, but I do believe, and I, and I just go back to Ezekiel uh, 38, 39, is the rest of it. Is the rest of it. I mean, you carefully study the Old Testament. The Israel that is to be formed in the land in Ezekiel 38 and 49 is not a righteous nation. In the last days of the tribulation, uh, two-thirds of those people are uh, destroyed as the nations come against them. So this thought, well, it can't, can't be a really of God what happened in 1948 because surely if God had a nation he brought him back they'd be righteous people well not according to the Old Testament but anyway I'm kind of sidetracking there the point is this I do think he's talking about the last days and so with that thought in mind I look at verse 2 it says for men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, petty, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. He said this is going to be prevalent in the last days. And I compare that to what we read back in Proverbs chapter 30. In verse 11, he said, the, this generation curseth father and mother. In first or Second Timothy 3, verse 2, he talks about them being disobedient to mother and father. Verse 12 of Proverbs 30, he talks about uh, the generation who are pure in their own eyes. They think very highly of themselves. In verse 4 of Second Timothy 3, he talks about these people being high-minded, conceited toward self. In chapter 13, or chapter 30, verse 13 of Proverbs, he talks about this generation being lofty in their own eyes. They are lifted up, if you will. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, he talks about these people being boasters and proud. Here again in Proverbs 30, verse 14, he talks about this generation 
having teeth as swords, their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. And in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, verses 3 and 4, he talks about the relationships with people. They're truce breakers, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors. And I looked at those two passages, and I see similarities between the term that he uses, this generation of Proverbs 30, and what we're told about in the last days here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. So here's the point. I don't want to be like this generation. I don't want to be like the generation of these last days. We see it. We see it all around us. Uh, you know, government, education, you know, just neighbor with neighbor. You see this attitude constantly manifesting itself. And Igor looks at Ithiel and Yukal and said, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like this generation. I have to recognize the generation for what it is and strive to honor my call as God's chosen generation. I have to come against the climate of the generation I live in. It doesn't make me popular and it doesn't make you popular, but it will make you right. And, and living right and living in accordance to what God says a man and a woman who are born again uh, should live like, again, won't make you popular, but at least it will make you right with God. And that should be all that really matters. So the question, do I recognize my need to live as one who has been made part of not this generation, but God's chosen generation to show forth the praises of him who has called us out of this darkness into his marvelous light? God expects us to live differently. And then notice verses 15 and 16 back in Proverbs chapter 30. Agor goes on and says, The horse leech hath two daughters, crying, Give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not it is enough. The grave and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not. It is enough. Here, Igor says, I need to recognize the need to be satisfied. He, he lists all these things that are not satisfied. These are all very negative things, obviously. The grave is a negative thing. By the way, I realize that for you and me, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints, that God brought about death as a penalty curse when when we are born again that curse is lifted but i do not expect any christian to appreciate or enjoy the process of death because it was never intended that way so i, I think sometimes we need to be very careful when we see christians grieving not to be overly well in relation to have more faith in god they're going to see their loved one I mean, all that's true but understand, you know, that the, the attitude of death was never intended to be something that we should get all excited about. We should be excited at the fact that death cannot hold us, that we are in Christ part of the resurrection. As Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, but I think you get where I'm going with that. So he talks about all these negative things, the grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, the fire. You know, some arsonist walks into a house and takes a lighter or a match and he lights up curtains along the side of a window. That flame is not going to contain itself just to that curtain, consume the curtain itself. It's going to find its way onto the wood frame around the window. It's going to find its way into the sheetrock. And if not contained somehow, it's going to do what? It's going to burn down the house. It's not satisfied. You don't find cemeteries, you don't find death saying, oh, yep, enough people have died, that's enough, you know, we're, we're done with this now. No, no, that's not the attitude. So all these negative thoughts that he presents, he said they are never satisfied. He begins in verse 15 with a horse leech. Uh, a horse leech was just a large leech that would infest the nose and the mouth area of horses. So that's a horse leech. When I grew up on the farm, uh, we had a lot of horses, we had a lot of cattle, and uh, 
We didn't have horse leeches, so to speak, but we had big old horse flies. You know what I'm talking about when I say horse fly? Man, those things are huge. And I remember, you know, we'd be out, especially like before baling hay, and, uh, you know, a lot of the first several years, we just dropped the bales in the field, and we'd walk, walk along beside the wagon, you know, throw them up on the wagon and have somebody up there stack them real high. And uh, we'd get into the, get into the barn, the upper level of the barn. We called them hay mouths. And you'd stack the hay all the way to the very peak of the top of the barn. And you, the higher you get, the less oxygen you have, the more heat you have. And, I mean, we'd just be pouring sweat. It was hot, you know, you wouldn't even notice because you're getting all scratched up by the hay or the straw, whatever you are stacking. You wouldn't notice it, and all of a sudden, man, you just feel this pain. And you look on your shoulder, and there's this big old fly. I mean, those flies got like that. Huge. And, man, they hurt like crazy. And if, if you were fast enough and you smacked it, you'd regret it because they were filled up with blood. They were sucking blood. And you hit that, man, blood goes everywhere. And that's what he's talking about here, the horse leech infecting uh, a horse. It would get inside the mouth or inside the nose, and the horse can't do anything about it except suffer. And that leech, what's it, what is it doing? It's sucking blood, and it's going to continue to suck blood and suck blood and suck blood. Why? Because the leech is never satisfied. Well, that's certainly a, a negative picture. Never satisfied, never satisfied. And a lot of people live life never satisfied never satisfied but we're told this in hebrews 13 5 let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have for he has said i will never leave thee nor forsake thee now i consider the second half of that verse he said this is the reason that you ought to live life with contentment and satisfaction not because you have the latest model car not because you have a three-stall garage and a jacuzzi and, you know, two and a half baths. He said, you got me. You have me. I'm reminded what he tells us in the book of James. One thing, nothing more. One thing, nothing more in James chapter 1. Just him. Jesus Christ should satisfy us. You know, if tonight your house were burned to the ground, you can't lose him. You can lose your house. You can lose a job. You can lose a vehicle. You can't lose him. He abides in us forever. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. To be satisfied with Jesus Christ, that should be the attitude and the desire of our lives. And I include verse 17 in this. The eye that mocketh his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and young eagles shall eat it. Let me just say this. I know we got a couple teenagers in here tonight. Be satisfied with the family that God has given you. Uh, Sometimes, I, I grew up in a broken home. Uh, I know Lots and lots of people grow up in broken homes. That's kind of the, that's actually the norm now uh, uh, for people to grow up in broken homes. And I remember sometimes as a kid, I'd watch other people in the big old church I attended, and I'd, I'd see these really tight families, both mom and dads around, and you know you get kind of envious of it. Wow, look at look at the home life they got. Look what I got. You know what? God says, just be satisfied with what I've given you. I have, a, I have a reason for you being where you're at. So just as a piece of advice to those in this room tonight, be satisfied with the family that God has given you. Be satisfied with the family God has given you. Recognize the need in your life to be satisfied. Do I recognize Jesus as my satisfaction Needing nothing more. I, I mentioned that verse, James chapter 1, verse 4. But let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire. What? Wanting nothing. I remember probably about six, seven years ago, that, that just struck me. Never really paid much attention to those two last words. Wanting nothing. 
one team never. We're all in agreement. I'm satisfied with you. You can take everything away. I'm satisfied with you. Now, you say, Pastor Vaughn, is that a reality in your life? Well, I hope it's becoming more and more of a reality. I'm, I'm just going to put it that way. I can't imagine, you know, I, I see my nephew and his wife, and they, they serve in a church up in Ohio. And uh, his wife had cancer. Uh, she was young. She was in her mid-30s. Praise the Lord, she's cancer-free now. Th they've been through that battle, and now they're watching their son suffer. And I know I know what's been going through his mind. We were texting each other last night a little bit, and he said, you know, I, I've, been, I've been trusting the Lord. What he said, it's like the Lord has brought me to a place where I'm, I'm beginning to struggle with this. He said, we watched the lights kind of being taken out of your son. Now, I, I, I trust that Zion's God will spare him. That's the, the way we're praying. But you, you know what it's like. Some of you have been through those things. And you watch that, and it's like, Lord, I, I do want to be satisfied with you, but I don't want to lose my mate, and I don't want to lose my children, and I don't want to lose this, and I don't want to lose that. So I'm not going to stand here and tell you, that, oh, yeah, you know, I've come to the point in my life where none of these things would ever cross my mind. I'm not saying that. But I am saying this. The Lord is teaching me to be satisfied with him. I, I think about the Hollands up in Sauchee, Canada. They've been up there for years. They've seen very few converts. Yet they just remain faithful. And I and I just can't help but wonder, are they just have they reached the point where they just they're just satisfied with him no matter how many how many people get saved. You know, they're they're not in control of that anyway. That's that's the Holy Spirit's doing. They're satisfied with him. So God, no matter if it's like uh, Joe Wynn down in Mexico where they have a thousand saved every month or whether it's Saudi Canada where they see one saved maybe once a year or so. God, whatever you have, I'm first and foremost, I'm just satisfied with you. Do I recognize Jesus as my satisfaction? Needing nothing more. Man, I, I hope that that thought, if you remember nothing else tonight, remember that, walk out of this room saying, Lord, help me to have that kind of satisfaction in who you are in your person. So that no matter what comes my way, I'm always satisfied because of who you are in my life, wanting nothing more. All right, I've gone over a little bit tonight, so I hope people will forgive me for that. Sure glad to have you folks with us tonight. And, um, if, you, if you don't mind, if you got like a card, uh, I won't make you hand it to me. <laughs> What's that? Okay, I'll get it from him then. And uh, that, that sounds good. But thanks for coming tonight and blessing us with your, your songs tonight. Praise the Lord for that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Sure. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll have you laid up here on the communion table and that way. Okay, sounds good. That, that sounds good. Thank you for that. Well, let, let me go ahead and pray together, and I'm just going to go ahead and step out, and then we're going to stay and pray for a little bit. I encourage you to do that. Thank our, thank our guests for coming tonight. Father, again, I, I praise you for being good to us. Lord, I thank you for this book that you continue to teach us. And Lord, just strengthen our walk with you. I pray you continue to do that in me. I need it. We all need it. And Lord, I ask that you would just work in Grace Baptist to make us more and more into your image. And I know it does not happen just by trying to mimic you, but by allowing your Holy Spirit to live through us. And we ask that it would. Father, I pray you take us home with your safety tonight. I ask, Lord, that throughout this week that you would do a special work and help us to glorify your name. And Lord, we'll thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I will say goodnight, and we will see you later.